Thank you very much. Uh, I am very proud uh, to be here. Thank you very much to Sir Maggie Yacob for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you about these topics. It's great to be in this country, which, you know, it's, it's rare for me to find a country that has a longer history and richer history than my own country. I'm from Italy, uh, but I did find it here. Though I have to say, my country still has something good, and by talking to the people on the street here in Egypt and to taxi driver, it seems like now the only thing that Italy has going for itself now is actually this which is <laughs> a, a, a very famous, apparently, Egyptian football player. And everyone uh, that has been talking to me has been asking me, where are you from? And when I say I'm from Italy, they say, oh, Salah, Salah. Um, so, but there's more. You should come to Italy. Uh, but to the serious stuff, I'm going to talk about universal health coverage uh, from the point of view of uh, the work we've done with Sir David on, uh, uh, at the World Innovation Summit for Health. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you from that point of view, although I have to uh, confess my original sin of spending many years at McKinsey, which uh, if you listen to David, that means you shouldn't listen to me at all. But uh, hopefully now I have, I, I have a different hat on. So the World Innovation Summit for Health, just a very brief introduction, is a, is a global summit that happens in Doha, in Qatar, every year and a half. Uh, uh, and brings together over a thousand people, uh, over 20 ministers, and people from, uh, from roughly 90 countries. Every uh, topic that is discussed is not only uh, a group of experts on stage, but has a year of work going on uh, before that to create reports and to have an evidence-based discussion. So last year, one of the topics was universal health coverage, and we put together a, a global advisory group with some of the best, uh, biggest experts uh, in the world on the topic. And then uh, uh, Sir David was chairing that group and I had the pleasure to, to be an author uh, on, on this report. So the report, by the way, is available outside in, in English and in Arabic. So if you're interested in, uh, in reading it, it's there. Um, so on universal health coverage, uh, first of all, what do I mean by it? The WHO defines it as the goal of trying to ensure that all people obtain health services without suffering financial hardship when accessing them. And it's a very important and basic concept that has become, I think the, the first big thing in this global movement for universal health coverage was the idea of, of selling the importance of the topic. And I think there is now a consensus of how important universal health coverage is and it's, it's great to see how it's such a high priority uh, for Egypt uh, now as well. Uh, in fact, the, the Director General of the WHO has defined it as the most powerful uh, concept in public health. And it is so because it can provide a whole series of benefits, and not only the, uh, the health benefits that in many ways might be, might be obvious, but also economic benefits and political benefits. Because from a government point of view, if you're able to expand health coverage successfully, provide access to people for health services, from a very practical standpoint, it's actually something that would bring votes and would bring, bring consensus. Uh, but I think the economic argument is also very important, and we were just touching upon it in terms of uh, how health then facilitates and supports a whole a host of other things. And th there has been some tremendous work done on this because it's important also because no health reform uh, of, of a significant magnitude can probably succeed if only the health minister is proposing it, right? It needs buy-in at the top levels. It needs the heads of state to buy-in. It needs the finance ministry to support it and pay for it. So I think to make the point of the benefits of investing in health, and there has been an excellent Lancet Commission on the topic, is very important. Because with an healthier population, you get better productivity, you get better education, the kids miss less days of school if, they, if they're healthier. Uh, you get more investment because uh, people with a longer life expectancy have actually been proved to, uh, to save more. You can have improved access to natural resources if you're able to a stronger health system to, uh, uh, to eliminate endemic diseases. And then you get, at least in the short term, probably not in the long term, but at least in the short term, from a demographic point of view, you get a better 
ratio of, uh, of working people to dependent people uh, by having a, a healthier population. So in terms of how to do it and in terms of the big strategic choices to make are on universal health coverage, this is a very classic representation that has been popularized by many, including the WHO, of the trade-offs that at a very simple level a government needs to go through. So if you have a, a fi finite amount of money, you need to make choices in terms of uh, how much financial protection you offer, how many uh, services you want to cover, and what percentage of the population you want, uh, you want to cover. So this has been the way in which the problem has been looked at for, for many years. And over the years, there have been a lot of experiments along those lines, particularly in the area of financing, experimenting with uh, user fees, experimenting with voluntary insurance, so giving people the options to purchase insurance. And we know how, when we are healthy, uh, there is much less of an incentive to actually purchase an insurance. And therefore, when, when something actually happens, if you are uncovered, you, it becomes even catastrophic, right? It's very much the, uh, more of the American model of doing things, which, you know, I'm, uh, I'm sure there are many things on which to follow the lead of the US, but probably the healthcare system is not, uh, is not at the top of them. And, and actually, over the years, many organizations, the World Bank, the WHO, have supported various approaches to universal health coverage, but a bit of a consensus is emerging and is supported by uh, the evidence. And the idea being that you, uh, uh, the, there, are, there is a right way or a, an ideal way to go about trying to achieve universal health coverage. The first one is around navigating the trade-off between services and population, and the idea that it would be better to uh, have a smaller package of services at the beginning, but to cover the whole population, and I'll go a little bit in detail on that. Uh, in terms of funding mechanisms, I think there is very strong evidence that the compulsory uh, financing mechanisms are more effective, things like taxation or uh, mandatory insurance. And then the very important aspect of care being free at the point of delivery, as we've seen yesterday uh, in, the, in the heart center as well. The importance for access, for people not having to pay when they need to access uh, services. So first of all, the, this trade-off between the two dimensions here of population coverage and service coverage. So you could go about it in two ways, right? If you have to start somewhere, you could start by offering a small portion of the population a bigger package of services, or you could try to offer to the whole population a basic package that you can then expand. And based on the experience, on the experience of many other countries, it does seem like the choice of starting with the whole population and then building up a service package is the most, uh, is the most effective one. And one of the big reasons for that is the risk of creating an, what we call an uncovered middle. Because you, you'll have a situation where the wealthiest segments of the population will have, still have access to, to healthcare. They're able to pay for it, right? Uh, and if you start targeting specific segments of the population, usually it's, uh, you, you start from, uh, from the poorest. But then you leave this middle, which is a bit left to itself and is at constant risk of suffering uh, a, an, an healthcare event, having to pay for it, and then actually falling below the poverty line. So it's very important uh, from what we found to try to start from the whole population. You will always have, uh, the wealthier segments have, will have more choice, more access, but at least uh, for everyone else there will be an equitable uh, access. And an example of a country that did things differently is actually the example of Chile, um, which you can't see it but uh, I, I, I can talk to you about it. Uh, in Chile, actually, they used to have a pretty uh, well-developed universal health coverage system. I think it's that. Yeah. Uh, a pretty well-developed universal health coverage system. But then, uh, in the 70s, uh, they introduced a private insurance option in this, so people could opt out, opt out of the public health insurance scheme and, and go into this private health insurance. So what that created was then a situation where 15% uh, of the population actually chose to move to the private scheme. But because they tended to be wealthier, they drew out 50% of the resources from the public insurance. And now they have efforts underway to try 
to reunite these this funding pools. And uh, actually, in our commission for this, we had Jeanette Vega, who's the chair of the public health insurance in, uh, in Chile. And it's just been incredibly dif difficult to walk this back. So again, it's, it's very important to try to have the old population covered and ideally to not fragment the, uh, the funding pools. It's fine. I, I, it's, I, I will go on. So the, the other topic, obviously, in that box that we saw before was financing and, and how to fund uh, the system, and I've, uh, I've touched on a few uh, of the experiments that have been made in that. And I think there is, on that, very strong evidence that compulsory mechanisms, whether it is an insurance, uh, whether it is taxation, are, are, are more effective to deliver universal health coverage, if that is the goal. So in many ways, this is the system that was, that was established in, uh, uh, in, in, in England, in the UK, and it's, it's proven to be effective from the point of view of ensuring access and coverage, but also from the point of view of sustainability. And a great example of a country that, uh, in an emerging health system that did that, introduced uh, a, a mandatory scheme and had great success with it was, uh, was Thailand who uh, introduced the universal coverage scheme where people actually at the beginning had to pay a very, very little fee for, in terms of uh, insurance fee. But it was extremely successful and this graph shows the number of people that uh, were uh, falling be below the poverty line because of catastrophic health expenditure and how the trend was expected to go. But then because of the introduction of this insurance scheme, that was reduced by two-thirds, actually. So an extremely successful and actually very cheap um, approach that was implemented. So we, we've done this work. We've looked at the big strategic choices. And it's actually through that that roughly a year ago, um, uh, Sir Magdi got in touch. And we discussed how this could be relevant, particularly in the, in the context of us one and building on the experience of the, of the heart center. So to get a bit more practical then on how to deliver uh, universal health coverage, and you've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of examples and a lot of detailed discussions on, on some of the most important aspects. So, uh, but from a high level point of view, there we identified three main ingredients that are needed to build a stronger health system. Uh, one being the stakeholder support, both from the point of view of top level political support, as we were saying, by the head of state in many cases, We've done an analysis looking at all the major universal health coverage reforms uh, after World War II, and basically all of them were not led exclusively or uh, primarily by the health minister, but uh, were actually a key point in the political platform of a head of state. If anything, probably the UK is the exception uh, if we look at the important role that uh, Bevan played uh, as a health minister. Then the importance of governance, of course, having strong institutions. Uh, as, as David was saying, at a bare minimum, the role of the government would be to put the environment in place for the health system to then succeed. And in institutions, regulations, and, and monitoring are key uh, elements of that. And lastly, but probably most importantly, the availability of resources. And we've, uh, we've already discussed the topic in terms of of GPs and how to build capacity from both the point of view of workforce, of uh, institutions, of, uh, of, uh, of actually buildings, and also the very important uh, area of, of medicines. So for Egypt and for us one, when thinking about how to deliver universal health coverage, the other thing is looking at how to do it with the best value for money. The, the money is obviously limited. So this was, is an analysis that was done, not by us, but it charted countries based on their life expectancy, this health-adjusted life expectancy, versus how much they spend on healthcare. So you see that actually, for the first thousand dollars, you know, the, the more you spend, the more value you get out of it. But then a lot of the countries that spend more tend to go down this path. So they get very, very little increases in life expectancy, for uh, exponential growth in, in terms of, of health expenditure. And I went back to this graph and I tried to figure out where Egypt currently stands. And it's, it's actually in the most interesting position because it's that red uh, thing there. It, and it really is at the crossroad. 
Uh, it has a very young population, but a population that eventually will grow, uh, will grow older. And it has, I think, a great opportunity to try to look at ways in which uh, healthcare can be delivered in, in, in a way that delivers the most value for money and that helps it go up this graph rather than going right and having a very high cost, uh, a very high cost system for very limited uh, gain. So in practice, what, what that means is that if we go back to the trade-off between uh, population coverage and service coverage and look at the services that need to be delivered, you need to make that evaluation of where to start based on value for money as well. How can you get the biggest return on, on your investment? And uh, we looked at this problem and at this choice in the context of uh, Aswan. I have to say from a very outside-in perspective, but with the, with the guidance of, of Sir Magdi, and identified three main areas that could be of good value for money for, uh, for Aswan. First of all, looking at strengthening the primary care system, as we've, as we've discussed, uh, given the impact that it can have, not only in terms of healthcare delivery, but also in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, prevention and public health interventions, it has a great potential to make a, a difference in that. Uh, you know, looking obviously with the example of the art center of how the quality of, of, on, in the general hospital setting could be, uh, could be improved would be another very important thing. And then the importance of, uh, of diagnostics and how both in the primary care setting and in the acute care setting, strengthening the diagnostic capability uh, could, be, could be important here uh, in Aswan. So the last thing we then did was look at, uh, again, from a very outside perspective, at how much could it cost and what benefit can it deliver? Um, and there are lots of international benchmarks on that. We went for the most conservative benchmark, so, you know, uh, based on some work done by Chatham House in the UK and on this Lancet Commission, we estimated that at a bare minimum to deliver some of the basic components of that strategy you would need an investment in Aswan of roughly $20 million a year. But the benefits that that could deliver uh, could be huge, although uh, I realize not as uh, ambitious as some of the country level, uh, of the country level objectives that Egypt already has. I would say this is probably on the low end of investment that we've looked at. But I think, you know, when talking about spending a, a significant amount of money like this, the uh, the thing that is important to go back is the, the idea of, of, of the economic impact that that could create as well. So it's not to be seen as an expenditure, but really as an investment. And again, uh, some of the work in the literature suggests that for every uh, pound you put into the health system and in healthcare, the return could eventually be nine to 20 times that in terms of, of GDP growth. Uh, actually for uh, more uh, emerging countries, more towards the higher end of that. So again, it means that if you put $20 million in the health system, eventually you would expect a return in terms of GDP growth of anywhere between 180 and 400 million, which if looked at in proportion to the GDP in Aswan, uh, it would be a huge boost to the, to the local economy. And hopefully that's you know, one additional argument that can be used to uh, to convince people of the importance of, uh, of investing in health. So that is all from me and very happy to take questions. <laughs>